Hi, everyone. Welcome to Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford sitting next to my partner in crime, Wes Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. And Wes, coming off of Monday Night Football, we watched the New Orleans Saints pretty much dismantle the Indianapolis Colts. (laughs) The reason I'm starting there is because with two weeks to go now in the regular season, we have four teams in the NFC that are all at 11-3, and three, the 49ers, the Seahawks, the Saints, and the Packers. So the race is on for division titles in the NFC West and the NFC North. The race is on for those top two seeds and the first-round buys that would go with those in the NFC. And Matt LaFleur on Monday, his weekly Monday day-after game press conference, made the Packers' objective over these last two weeks pretty clear. It is about winning to earn as many home games in January as possible. This team wants to be playing at Lambeau Field because as of now, they aren't coming back. Right. <laughs> Two road games. The Packers want to get back <laughs> to Lambeau in January and play at home again. Yeah, and Zadarius Smith kind of talked about it too with wearing his jacket. He has this nice leather kind of fur jacket in the <laughs> locker room. Uh, you don't want to be out there in January. It's it's tough. It's a tough environment to play, and the Packers are able to practice in it every single week at this point. And it's been a very cold November and December. So that is a big advantage for them if they can make this thing go. And, you know, I've talked to ad nauseum about, you know, Rogers' feelings on it and the importance of it. And I know there's been this this sentiment. I even had this conversation with my buddy Scott a few days ago. Well, Rogers seems to always play well in warmer environments or in domes. Sure. But you're talking about communication issues. You're talking about crowd noise. I mean, you think of the Superdome, what that place is like when it's not a playoff game. Yeah. You know, Levi Stadium, I think, has a really good environment to it as well and a home field advantage for the 49ers. So unless they're playing in AT&T Stadium in Dallas, which just seems (laughs) to be Lambeau South. Right, right. uh, It's just you want to be able to play these January games at Lambeau Field. And the way that this lines up for Green Bay right now with back-to-back games against Minnesota and Detroit, they're in a position to not only do that right now, but also get that first round by, that very coveted first round by. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to go through the scenarios quickly, the Packers need one win to win the NFC North Championship. They can either beat the Vikings this coming week or beat the Lions in Week 17 to win the NFC North. If you win the NFC North, you are guaranteed at least one home game. The Packers would be no worse than the three seed. But to get a top two seed, which would come with which uh, a first round buy would come with that, the Packers need to win their last two games. That would get them no worse than the two seed. And then the number one seed is also in play because if the Packers were to win their last two games, and if both the Seahawks and the 49ers <laughs> each take one more loss, then the Packers would actually be the one seed. So. If you can keep all that straight. And I'm doing my best to. But at this point, it's one week at a time because the Packers can win the NFC North, and that's all they can win. Monday night in Minneapolis, the Packers can win the NFC North. Meanwhile, the Vikings are looking to clinch a playoff spot because they need one more win to knock the Rams officially out of contention and get themselves in the playoffs here. So, um, But, yeah, this whole thing, I mean, we've heard Aaron Rodgers talk about wanting to play – games at home. Obviously, the Packers, we all know they made their Super Bowl run in 2010. It was all on the road. They, ha- But they have not, in the Aaron Rodgers era, they have not played an NFC Championship game at home. They lost on the road at Seattle with the, the big comeback, obviously. And then you remember the game in <clears throat> 2016 in the Georgia Dome. I mean, once that one, once the snowball started going yeah. the wrong way down the hill, there was just well, there was just no stopping it. Yeah. And and that that's the thing that is it's so hard to rally in those situations when you're on the road in the playoffs and and you know that crowd that home crowd is feeling the excitement of their team advancing. And that's what's funny about this year and and people when asking about the identity stuff and, and the conversations around that. I still feel like this 2019 team slants more towards that 2014 team than 16. 16, that was an amazing train that took them all the way yeah, to the that, NFC title Yeah, that was game. a completely different type of season when you're sitting at four and six and the last six weeks of the regular season, you're playing with your back against the wall. And, and when they got to the NFC title game, not that that was a, a consolation or just a moral victory, but... Let's be honest, Mike. I mean, they were really up against some stuff in that game with where the roster was at at that point, the the attrition that it had taken to put themselves on that run, and the gas kind of ran out. 
what's exciting about this particular uh, you know team is I just feel like even though we've talked over and over again about they still have that best game out there, they're healthy. They have players have stepped up at different positions, and they are in a position where they're finally controlling their own destiny again during this final stretch of yeah. the season. Yeah, they have it in their own hands. And when you don't have to rely on X, Y, and Z to, to play out for you to have the scenario that you want for your playoff implications, that just goes such a long way. But you and I both know it, Mike, and you can play it back. If we had a little bit better technology, we could play back the last three weeks of Unscripteds, talking about how you had to beat the Giants, you had to beat Washington, you had to beat Chicago yeah. to make this game meaningful. Well, Mike, this game on Monday night at U.S. Bank Stadium is the most important game of the season for the Green Bay Packers, and they've put themselves in a position for it to have those kind of stakes. Yeah, it is the biggest game of the regular season, no question about that. And uh, I do believe, as I said in Insider Inbox on Monday, I think the Packers are going to have to play their best game of the season in order to win it. I know we're a little bit short on time today, so I want to get to a couple of other things, and we certainly have plenty of time the rest of the week to talk about this big Monday night matchup in Minneapolis. A couple of players that are starting to make their presences felt a little bit, and I'm talking about one guy on each side of the ball, Jake Kumaro at wide receiver and Rashawn Gary, the rookie first-round pick on defense. Starting with Kumaro, he hasn't had a whole lot of catches this season. He's not lighting up the uh, the stat sheet by any means. But if there is one stat that jumps out about Jake Kumaro, it's that he's averaging, I believe it's around 19 yards per catch. 19.3 yards 19. per catch. 19.3. When he does make a play, it's a significant one. And obviously his one play against the Chicago <laughs> Bears was a huge one, 49 yards with the catch and run. He's a guy... I don't know how there, certain guys have a knack for it, Wes. Mm-hmm. Certain guys have a knack for being able to get yards after the catch. Kumaro showed on that play against Chicago that he's just he's got some kind of a some kind of a knack or an instinct for that because that was a very simple play and he turned it into a big explosive. He is one. a gritty, 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 grit warrior. I mean, that's just the <laughs> type of player he is right now. Uh, because here's the thing, Mike. Okay. Let's just start off from the beginning of that play. Jake Kumaro didn't know whether or not he stepped out of bounds. He knew what his assignment was, he fulfilled it, and he did exactly what he was supposed to do on the play. And because he trusted all those things and trusted his instincts, it put him in a position to not only catch the ball where Aaron Rodgers put it, but it kept him in bounds. Okay, so that's the beginning of it. He got the first down. Very big first down. You get ha-ha Clinton Dix coming from the top. So that's this incident where a lot of times the receiver can get the, you know, hear the footsteps, make you double think catching that ball, make you double think where your footwork is. But Kumro stayed true to all of his fundamentals, all of his technique, not only catches the ball, but avoids Clinton Dix and turns up field. Yeah. The one thing, everyone wants to compare players, right? The one thing since the very beginning that Jake Kumro reminds me of a lot of is Randall Cobb. And they are completely different receivers. Right. But if you look at how they approach the game after the ball is in their hand, they look to turn up field and they can make guys miss for different reasons, but they can make guys miss. And and I just think when you see Kumaro, this is him and Alan Lazard are one and the same in this, in that these are two guys that were undrafted free agents, absolutely nothing given to them. They just need to drop one pass and they probably would have been cut, honestly. It's, <laughs> it's that kind of scenario a lot of times with those yeah. guys at the bottom of the depth chart. Quite possibly. And they did every single thing right. And Matt LaFleur went to the podium. He said, yeah, we got to get that guy more involved. Elvis Witted, his receivers coach, said, yeah, we got to get this guy more involved. He's the type of player that I think when you look about a stretch run here, and I'm not guaranteeing Jake Kumro is going to have 150 yards every week and eight catches, but he's the guy that when he steps up and is accountable in all of his assignments, it's going to create opportunities for him to make big plays at critical points in football games. Yeah, and he's also uh, he is one of many receivers in this uh, Packers wide receiver core that does his part with the blocking and the run game and whatnot, and that is why he gets the snaps that he does. And we've heard it for years and years and years, whether you go back to Donald Driver or Greg Jennings or (laughs) Jermichael Finley or whoever. With Aaron Rodgers, it's about taking advantage of that opportunity when it comes your way. And Jake Kumaro is one of those guys who does take advantage of the opportunity when it comes his way, and that 19.3 yards per catch, I think, speaks to that. And by the way, not that this would qualify because he doesn't have enough catches, the league leader right now is 20 yards per catch. I believe that was Mike Williams from the Chargers. From the Chargers, yeah. So it just shows you. I mean, again, he needs more of a workload, but that's the type of impact he's making in a short you know, kind of window here. Yeah. Well, switching gears quickly to Gary on the defensive side of the ball. This is a young man. 
Fans have been wondering where are the snaps? When is he going to play more? Where is the impact from the number 12 overall pick in the draft? The Packers have been bringing him along slowly. They haven't needed to throw him in there for 50 snaps a game because you have the two Smiths at outside linebacker. The last couple games against Washington and Chicago, we've seen (coughs) Gary play, I believe it was 13 snaps against Washington, 18 snaps against Chicago, starting to rack up tackles, starting to rack up more of an impact. I featured him in my What You Might Have Missed a little bit last week. You're featuring him as a player on the rise in a written piece um, this week. He got his second sack of the season against the Chicago Bears. This is a young man who has embraced the role he's been given. He has embraced the tutelage that he can receive from all three of the Smiths, including Mike Smith, his position coach. And uh, um, and he's 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 right where he needs to be, and he's in a position to really help this defense down the stretch. He really is, Mike, because it's actually really funny. For the first time in eons, uh, outside linebacker is not a real question going into next season. They know what the foundation is. It's the Smiths, and it's going to be Gary as that up and comer behind them. Yeah. You go back to either one of those young men, Preston or Zadarius. Now they might have had a few more sacks. They might have played a few more snaps. But it took time to hone that position and find their way in this league. And, and both of them are breaking out now in year five right. with Green Bay. Rashawn Gary turned 22 years young <laughs> earlier this month. I mean, and I the one thing that Mike, Mike Smith says over and over again, this is a guy that gets it, he buys in, and he trusts what is being asked of him. Because everyone just thinks, okay, you, just, you, you draft a pass rusher, Mike, you throw him out there, you get the quarterback. That's your goal. See you at your contract extension. It doesn't work like that. It's about knowing, okay, being in a three-point stance, what's asked of you inside, like what Sedarius Smith does. What do you got to do to pop up and explode into that rush so it's not just you're popping up and then being stood up right away. It's your pad level. Right. It's being on the outside of the – and and getting the proper step on the tackle because if you don't, he's already backed a step or two into his stance, and now all you have to go with is your bull rush. I mean, it's knowing those little – intricacies that are so important and those are fundamentals those, those are those, fundamentals those are fundamentals that you can when you have the talent and the athletic ability you can get away with not being completely on your p's and q's mm-hmm. with your fundamentals in college football you get into the nfl the other guy is flat out going to beat you yep. if you are not on top of those fundamentals on every single snap and that's what young players have to because learn as they go along it doesn't matter if you're Zadarius or preston smith or you're a young guy like rashawn gary i guarantee you that tackle has seen every single rep that his coach has put up of you in the previous week <laughs> right. in showing all of your tendencies. So every, being yep, able to evolve, done. adapt. But more than anything, I asked Mike Smith this at the end of his news conference, his, his meeting with the press on Thursday. There is some confidence that goes into this too because Mike Smith isn't a guy that hands out you know celebratory cakes for his guys when they get a sack. Yeah, they're not walking out of that outside linebacker's room with lollipops in their he mouth after film sessions. always talks about pressures, but in some cases... Sacks are important for, cause, because a young guy like Gary, who maybe he hasn't had as many sacks as he wants, when you get that one, it reaffirms that you're doing everything right and you're on yeah. the path you need the to resu- be on. The results do matter when you're trying to build something as a young player. Yeah, and yeah. for him to be able to understand his role in that room and the fact that, okay, this is what is being asked of me today, it's a beautiful situation for him right now because so often you get a rookie first-round pick that's immediately thrown into the lineup and you're expected to be a pro bowler all the way. The Packers didn't take that tact with him. Yeah. They're taking a very methodical approach with them that, you know what? This is a guy that's going to be better tomorrow. You already know what you're getting with the Smith brothers. This is a guy that's coming up and is going to be that next guy that you can continue to build with and create more packages like they did against the Bears and using so many three outside backer yeah, packages as they did. Changing things up, going with a little bit of variety there. And whether it's Kumro or whether or not it's Gary, those are the type of guys that when you see those guys emerge late in the season – that's the wrinkle that you can add to your football team now as you shift into a playoff. Yeah, one of the cool things, too, with Rashawn Gary is when you're in the locker room and you see that his locker (laughs) is right in between Preston Smith and Zadarius Smith. It's just kind of a cool setup. Talk about sending a message, right? Yeah, absolutely. Who you're supposed to be learning from. (laughs) Well, I know we're short on time. I apologize for the short show today, but we've got a long week ahead of us to talk about this Packers-Vikings game, and we will do that as the week goes along. But for now, that's a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Please follow all of our coverage the team on Packers.com and subscribe to us, like us on iTunes and other podcast services. The Packers YouTube channel is also out there with all kinds of great video content. For Wes, I'm Mike. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. You're a mean one. 
Mr. Grinch, you really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus, you're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. 